What a wonderful day to worship the Lord. It's cold, but the sun is shining. Many, many, many of you have come in with smiling faces and great joy. Some of you very serious about keeping up with scores. I hope that's over so we can give our attention to the Lord. If you have your Bible, please make your way to Malachi chapter 4, verse 6, and then go just a little bit more. It's going to be on page 852 if you're using that pew Bible. If you've gotten to Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, you've gone too far. And if you're using your Bible app, you're just going to be stuck. There's no way to get there. What we're looking at this morning is that page between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's that blank one, one page there. Let's go ahead and take a look, shall we? Would you pray with me? Lord, as we look at your word and as we look at times when you were silent, as we look to your providence, to the ways that you work, to your promises that you would dwell with us and what you did and are doing so that you will be our God and we will be your people and that you will dwell with us and we will dwell with you, Lord, and in fact, dwell with you forever. In eternity. As we look to these things, God, speak to us. Don't be silent. I, I beg you, Lord, do not be silent this morning. But let us hear from you. By the power of your Spirit, illuminate from your providence and then from your word what you would have us to hear and see and learn this morning. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. As you've probably guessed, I'm on difficult ground this morning. I'm on I'm on dangerous space here. I'm preaching without a text. And if you know me, and if you've been here for any length of time, you know that's not how I preach, and you know that's not what we do. Normally, we we open up to God's Word first, and we read from His Word. And then, as a preacher of God's Word, I do my best to proclaim and herald what it is that He has given us from His Word, and then we seek to see that meaning and then apply that to our lives. And yet, today before us, we have a blank page. But it's not a blank page for us to write on, for us to put the story down, for us to declare what should be. No, this is God's blank page And God had a purpose behind this blank page. What you have in this blank page, if your your, uh, Bible publisher has put that blank page there, what you have is a page that represents about 435 years when God was silent. Theologians call this period, and it's a critically important period in the working of God, they call this the silent years. And if we really want to understand the wonder of Christmas, if we really want to put ourselves in this place to understand when when the light broke through, when the angels heralded truth, when John the Baptist came proclairing, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, if we really want to understand the magnitude of what was happening there, we have to see what was happening in these 435 years before because then we really will understand what it was like when the light broke through the darkness. And when the words of the angels and the words of the prophets then again sounded like a royal trumpet blast, heralding a call to come to the Lord. What we, we need to know is that God may have been silent to his people, to creation, but he was still working. He was working for us. He was working out his promises preparing a way for us to dwell with him and for him to dwell with us. 
So just like when we study any other passage of Scripture, what we need to do is we need to look at the context. We need to look at what was going on. We need to look at the background. And we need to see if we can discern the meaning that God has here. And you say, well, wait a minute. How is there meaning behind silence? If you've asked that question, you've never been a husband receiving the silent treatment from his wife. (laughs) Silence contains meaning. Ask public speakers when they employ the tool of a pregnant pause for effect. Ask a comedian the value of silence. Just because words aren't spoken, silence has meaning, and the same is true in the silent years. There is meaning to be seen here. So I hope that we can see and glean meaning from this silence. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the history of the silent years. That's, I don't have a lot to go on. So we're going to look at those years and we're going to see the providence of how God was working. It's the same way we understand the book of Esther. God's never mentioned and yet we see the providence. And then we're going to see what we can profit from this season, this silent year period. And then we're going to ask how we can apply that to our lives. So let's start with the history. I don't have a text to start with. I only have the silence. So why would I say that God was silent? Why would theologians say, hey, God was silent? Why wasn't he speaking? Because he wasn't. That's why they say it. Esther was the last event, the last recorded story in our Old Testament. And Malachi was the last identified prophet. And Esther, and then also Ezra, Nehemiah, and Malachi, all kind of right at the end, we're we're creating sort of a a bow on the end of that season. There were plenty of writings during the silent years, so don't, don't let that confuse you. There was lots of stuff being written. It's just that none of it was breathed out by God. None of it claimed to say, thus saith the Lord. None of it sounded like the voice of God, so therefore none of it was included in the Old Testament canon. It wasn't God speaking, it was simply man speaking. There's some helpful things there, but it's not from God. And we see like in the New Testament, Jesus and and many of the New Testament authors, they quote the Old Testament. In fact, there's about 300 clear, distinct quotes from the Old Testament and plenty of allusions. But you know what's interesting? They never one time quote from any of the writing in the silent years. Not one time. Only from the stuff we have clearly from God. Josephus, which was a a prominent Jewish historian in the first century, he wrote all kinds of interesting things that we find very helpful. He said this. He claimed that the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, had been fixed long ages ago. So in the first century, he said, a long time ago this thing has been fixed. And then he says it ended at the time of Artaxerxes and other books that were written 435 years later after Artaxerxes, he claimed, did not deem themselves worthy of equal credit with the earlier records. So this Jewish historian is saying, look, we don't have any any writings from God in this period. That's why we call it the silent years. Another reason we call it the silent years is there was no prophet in the land. There was no prophet after Malachi speaking. Jewish literature, although not written by God, Jewish literature gives us some really fascinating clues. 1 Maccabees 4, 45 through 46, and praise the Lord, the fantastic young woman translating this into Ukrainian said, what scripture are you quoting? I'm not quoting scripture here. I'm quoting Jewish literature that helps us see something. So in this, in this book, it talks about when the altar of God was defiled and tore down. And the people didn't know what to do with those defiled stones. Here's what it says. It says, So they tore down the altar and stored the stones in a convenient place on the temple hill. Now hear this. Until there should come a prophet to tell what to do with them. They recognized there was not a prophet to guide them and direct them. And then later in 1 Maccabees 9.27, the author talks about a tremendous distress of the people. And to compare this stress, he says, Such distress had not been seen since the time that the prophets ceased to appear to them. There's no prophet in the land. The Jewish people understood this completely in the Babylonian Talmud. Talmud's something the Jewish people read. It's commentary. It's a Jewish writing. They say this. 
after the latter prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi had died, the Holy Spirit departed from Israel. There's no prophet. And then we're going to talk about these guys a little more, the Qumran community, the Aseans. These guys were the Dead Sea Scroll people that went off over in some terrible place to live and got out of Jerusalem. They, they isolated themselves from the rest of the world because the world had gone cuckoo pants in their opinion, and they were probably right. And they say this in, in Qumran Scroll number 1, column 9, verse 11, if you want to look it up. They say they've isolated themselves from the world and will not have anything to do with the world until there should come a prophet and the messiahs of Aaron and Israel. They were saying there's no prophet in the land. Even our own scriptures breathed out by God, Hebrews 1, 1 through 2, says, long ago, this was written in the first century, long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. In these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Even our own scriptures say it was long ago when the prophets spoke. God was not writing new books. He was not making proclamation to his people. Not narrative being recorded. Not by way of the prophet. God was not giving what we call special revelation in that time period. You can always see there's God with general revelation, the mountains and the things he created and whatnot. But in that time period, nothing new was coming to the people. No revelation of what he was doing. No revelation of his actions. He was silent. Quiet. Now we could speculate all sorts of reasons why. We could take guesses. I'm not going to do that because God is not explicit about why he was quiet. I have my thoughts, but I, I don't know. He doesn't say why. But I can imagine the longing of the people in that 435 years. I can imagine the desire, oh, where are you, God? Why are you not speaking, God? Why is there no prophet to lead us among the priests and the kings? What are you doing, Lord? I can just imagine this desire. Oh, come, Lord. Oh, come, Messiah. Oh, come, Emmanuel. What? Can't you just sense that? I can imagine the difficulty in the waiting. I'm trying to discern what God might be doing in my life in a period of two months, and I can't take it. 435 years. Some of them waited their entire lives, born and died in that time period, never experiencing the joy of really truly hearing from the Lord in such a way that they were accustomed to. So this should lead us to the question, what was God doing in that 435 years? Was he absent? Did he take a vacation? Was he snoozing? Did he take a nap? No, not at all. God was incredibly active, and I'd like to show you. So the Hebrew scriptures were completed by about 435. There's some debate in there. It could have been a little more. We could be talking 400 years. But by 435 B.C.-ish, the Hebrew scriptures were completed. They had what they needed at that point. And when you remember at the end of the narrative, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, the Persians were ruling the land of Israel. They were in charge. Uh, but they allowed the Jewish people to start rebuilding their city, rebuilding the temple, worshiping the Lord. So, so fantastic. They're, they're moving into that season. And that goes along for some time. We don't have an account in our Bible, but we have plenty of historical record. In 331 B.C., a man by the name of Alexander, you probably know him as Alexander the Great, just ripped through the known world. I mean, he just conquered the known world. Part of the reason why he did that is because he wasn't as militant as many of the others. He was more shrewd, so the people didn't fight back as much. They were more open to his presence because he was serious about things that actually benefited the people. I mean, he was also serious about conquest. But he found ways that, that wooed them, like education. Like building a grand library in a city he founded in Alexandria. By letting them worship and, and allowing them to do some things. Now, it was all controlled by the Greeks. But he had this kind of control. He, and he pushed a common language. That they would all know Greek. You know why? 
So you don't have to have a little translator thing to talk about things. So you can do business together. So when the military does have to make some instruction and commands to the people, they can all communicate together. That was part of his strategy, that we all speak the same language throughout the whole world. It was as if he was taking the Tower of Babel and saying, let's reverse this curse so that we can communicate. He established this huge library in Alexandria where education became important where understanding how to copy scrolls became important. It said they had more scrolls and more manuscripts there than anywhere else in the history of the world at that point in time, maybe even today. We don't know. The only thing we know for sure is that archaeologists found glitter in the children's wing because that stuff never goes away. (laughs) Alexander was serious about this stuff, but unfortunately, he grew ill. There's a lot of theories on what may have happened. In three 23 BC, so not that much longer after he came through Israel, he died unexpectedly, and he had no plan of succession. And his kid, who should have been the heir to the the Greek empire, was tiny. And a group of leaders said, what are we going to do? I mean, we're spread thin all over the known world. How are we going to handle this? And they decided that the best thing they could do in this vast Greek empire is divide up the various regions among their generals. And so, for a time, Israel was put under Ptolemy, and that became what's called the Ptolemy dynasty. And he continued the educational efforts and the language efforts uh, that the whole Greek empire was about, as were the other generals in their various regions. Unfortunately, politics gets involved, and through a series of politics and backstabbing and wars and problems in-house, inside the Greek community, the, uh, the Ptolemy dynasty had some stuff restructured. So they still ended up down in Egypt, but the Seleucids came in, and then they were the ones in control in Israel. Okay, that happened in 198 BC. However, the Ptolemy-Seleucid period was still all Greek. In fact, it's called the Hellenistic period. Now, some of you may or may not understand what that is. I learned a lot just looking at this. Helen was the Greek name of the city Greece. And Hellenization was the effort of saying we're bringing Greek culture to all the people around the world. We want to Greekify all these places. And some of the people were really all about it. Some of the people loved this new culture coming in. These Hellenists in Israel or the Hellenistic Jews were the ones who embraced the Greek culture. And give it enough time, they're pretty much, even though not born necessarily Greek, they've adopted so much of the culture, they really become like Greeks. The Sadducees, which we read about in the New Testament, were the religious individuals who embraced this Hellenization and said, man, we love this. This is great. Let's, we, can, we can morph some of our stuff into this, and this is great, and we're going to be this kind of people. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were the religious leaders that said, no, thank you to this Hellenization. We are distinctly Jewish. We're different. We're not going to take it. So now you have these two kind of rival groups within uh, leadership and within the religion. And then there's a group of people called the Aseans or the Qumran community. They're the people that said, no, thank you. We're packing up shop. We're heading out into a commune out in the desert. And we're just going to live out there until the Messiah comes. We're done with this nonsense. I don't know how they planned to do that exactly because it was a men-only commune. But that's what they did. Okay? Now, those people happened to be the ones that had the Dead Sea Scrolls and their library cave system. So they've moved out of town. Other people are trying to figure out what to do with this Hellenization. And incidentally, just on a side note, there's a really good, reasonable theory that John the Baptist may have been one of the Essenes. He wasn't on the scene anywhere. And when he came out crying out in the wilderness, because he might have come all the way out of that Dead Sea community to cry back. We don't know for sure, but there is a pretty good argument for that. Now, it's about 250 B.C., during this period of time, when the uh, under Ptolemy, now in Egypt, though, because he's had some stuff shifted around, said, man, we need the Hebrew Bible in Greek. And so, they got 70 translators together, the best they could gather, and they translated the Hebrew Bible into the Greek language. It's called the Septuagint, which means 70, And it's indicated in your footnotes as LXX Roman numeral 70. It's the Septuagint. That was the the first translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek. It was part of this Hellenization. And incidentally, that was such a helpful tool that two-thirds of our New Testament quotes of the Old Testament 
were quoted from the Septuagint, not from the Hebrew. And we can tell just by the way the structure of the language works. That was a very, very helpful tool. Jesus likely read the Septuagint along with the Hebrew, and they spoke Aramaic. I mean, we had this massive morphing of things going on. A lot happening here. Many people groups were now coming together under the common language and the common culture. And what we find is God is now paving the way for people to hear the Old Testament, but also think about this, the New Testament, the good news of Jesus Christ, the Messiah who is to come. He's making a way for all the people who were conquered and all spoke different languages to speak the same language. Think about that in the shadow of the Tower of Babel. We'll just build ourselves up a giant kingdom. So we, languages are confused. This is the start of the languages coming together. We also see that in Acts 2, so that the gospel could go forth. Pretty interesting, right? Even the Roman Empire that eventually came had two official languages. They spoke Latin, but after they conquered this whole area, they adopted the Greek language as their second official language. That's how prevalent this language was throughout the whole known world. Now, in 142 B.C., a group of Jewish people called the Maccabees, this is where we get Hanukkah and the Festival of Lights and all that kind of stuff, they were sick of it. So we've had our fill. We're going to revolt. And they were successful. They actually managed to overthrow the Greek rule. And for a period of time, the Jewish people, uh, under a man named Simon, who then set up the Hesmonian dynasty, created self-rule of the Jewish people. The Greeks were now kicked out, and the Jewish people had their own opportunity for a king and all these sorts of things. And yet, it didn't seem to go super well. They couldn't agree on anything. This period of time, now under Jewish rule, actually caused greater division between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Greater problems with how we'd approach Scripture. Greater debate on how we would deal with culture. They had a lot of turmoil, and it was not pretty, which is sad because they should have been able to come back to what they were seeking and nobody could agree on what they were seeking. And guess what? The Essene people who should have been able to come back to the Jewish ruled nation said, forget that. We are not coming back. They did not come back in that time period. That just shows you it was still all over the map. And then in 63 BC, the Romans conquered Israel as they were sweeping through the known world. And the Roman Empire was growing it, just rapid, just like Alexander the Great, just ripped through all the known world, and Israel got swept up in that. Did you know that the Romans built 250,000 miles of road systems during their reign? And their road systems weren't dirt roads. They paved them with stones, many of which you can still walk on today, many of which are still used today. Why would they do this? Well, because they were very efficient at moving armies. They needed a way to move armies and not get them stopped down in mud bogs when it rained and, and make sure the carts had stuff. So they, they literally put stones and they paved 250,000 miles of roads, many of which ran right through Israel, some of which Jesus himself walked to get from place to place. And they put guards and patrols on these roads. So that what once was, was, once was a great opportunity for bandits, now became a safe opportunity on the Roman roads. They called it the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And it's where we get the line, all roads lead to Rome. Because <laughs> they did, in one way or another. Now, the gospel could travel all over the known world. God was paving the way for guys like Paul to take the gospel to far reaches of this empire and Jesus to walk through these places in safety and others to travel. Maybe like Lydia from Thyatira to Philippi. A road system was built. There's one more thing God was doing in those silent years. It's something we don't see until 1947. In 1947, a small shepherd boy out with his sheep throwing rocks up on a hillside. And one rock goes into some hollow space. And he hears some broken 
pottery or something to that effect on the other side. And he says, I better go check this out. And he goes up in there and he finds a cave. The cave is full of jars. Inside the jars are really old, dusty manuscripts and scrolls. He can't read any of them. He's an uneducated shepherd boy. So he takes some of those scrolls back to his mom. She doesn't know what to do with them because she can't read either. So for a while, she uses them to cook her food on in the fire. Can you imagine what got thrown in the fire and burned up? But eventually he goes, maybe I can make some money on this. I should talk to these people who are looking for scrolls and antiquities. And they go and they do this, and they find uh, that these are part of a very sophisticated library system of the Qumran community. Those people out there that say, we don't want to have anything to do with the world, we have found so far, I believe there's more, we have found 12 caves with more than 950 manuscripts and scrolls that were stored in their library over 200 of those are our Old Testament books. The only book not represented there is Esther. For a variety of reasons, there's all kinds of reasons why. We're not sure exactly. Every other book of our Old Testament was there. And you know what those Dead Sea Scrolls have proved for us? They have pro- and they've been absolutely invaluable in showing us the accuracy of our Bible. That telephone game nonsense? Nope. And we can look almost 2,000 years later sometimes 2,500 years later, and say this was copied between that time and this time, incredibly accurate. We learned that the copying system was trustworthy. And those scrolls have helped us to have even better translations, more reliable translations today. So in a time when there was doubt and there were problems, God's showing up again from the silent years by having those libraries and those scrolls protected. So God was unifying the language. He was educating the people. He was preserving his manuscripts. He was building a road system, all for the purpose of advancing the good news of Jesus Christ, that he would die in our place to pay for our sins that we don't even hardly embrace as ours, that he would show us and reveal his truth to us and show us our sin problems and our need for a Savior. And he'd be laid in the tomb after being crushed for our sins, that he'd be raised to new life, defeating death, that he would ascend to the right hand of the Father. This gospel, this good news was to go out through all the world, and for 435 years, it seems to me, God was preparing the way to make such a proclamation so that we could dwell with God, so that we could have that relationship. So while God might not have been revealing himself in the same ways that they were accustomed to, he was working. Well, they might have thought he was far away. He was right there, laying a brick in the road, laying another brick, laying another brick. He was right there helping with the translation. He was right there helping people learn the language. He was right there with them. They just didn't hear him. Because he was making a way for his people, including us, to dwell with him forever. Okay, and this is all fine and good and interesting. But what can we learn from God's silence to help us today? And at this point, I hope some of you are going, where is the scripture in this sermon? I hope you're feeling that. That was by design, because that's probably what they were saying for 435 years. Where is God's word? So let's think about what we can learn from this silence and the providence of what God was doing. I have three things I want to share. First, We need to remember that just because we might not be hearing from God clearly and loudly and precisely or feeling that he's maybe close to us, maybe you've had a season where you feel like God is far off, when you're going, where is God? Why won't he show me? Why won't he reveal himself? What's going on? We need to remember that that does not mean he's not working. Does not mean he's far. Just because you can't hear him doesn't mean he's not close by. Romans 8, 28 through 30. It says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Okay, what does good mean here? And what's the purpose he's talking about? He's talking about our salvation. He's talking about the fulfillment of his promises that we can be close to him and all for his glory. It goes on. It says, For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, 
he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. From the very beginning, he knew whose were his. And from the very beginning, he was making a way to redeem them and bring them into his family. Number two, we need to read and reread and reread and reread what God already said. They're in the 435 year period. Did they have scripture? You better believe it. Did they have God's word? Absolutely. What did they do? They went back to the word of God. They opened scrolls, they read, they studied because God had spoke. And that doesn't mean that what he said then wasn't gonna help, be helpful now. If you feel like you're in a silent period, a dry time, far from God, read, reread, and reread what God has already told you. And hold on to that and cherish it. It's what they did. And it's what we can do too. We have God's word. He's not silent to us. It's right here. We can do that. And Psalm 1, verse 2, says, The blessed one's delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. We can do that. Number three, we need to hold on to God's promises and what he said he will do even if we don't know the timing. And we need to have great anticipation that he will fulfill them. Maybe in our lifetime, maybe not. But he keeps his promises and we need to hold on to them with everything we can so that if you're in one of those seasons, you know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. It's a tunnel, not a cave. And you're gonna get through it and you're gonna be in great light and at some point the light will break through. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25 says this. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. Let's hold on. His promises are good, and we can be encouraging one another as we hold on. It goes on, 24 and 25. It says, and let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. And all the more as you see the day approaching. We need to be anticipating that the Lord will work personally in our lives, that the Lord is coming back, that the Lord is doing things. And we need to encourage our brothers and sisters on both sides of us, in the pew and everywhere around us, to hold on to his promises because he is working. Can you imagine what it must have been like after 435 years of silence, of what they thought was darkness? of uncertainty. Could you imagine after 435 years of that what it must have been like when the angels spoke for God to Mary, whoa, to Zachariah. He couldn't even talk after that. <laughs> kind of got himself into that, but think about that. Think about to the shepherds on the hillsides when the host of heaven, after 435 years of saying nothing, broke out into worship to say the Messiah has come. Think about that. Lighting up the night sky, breaking through the darkness. How wonderful. What about when the people heard the heralding of John the Baptist, prophet to come before the perfect prophet who would never die, who would be our prophet forever. The last prophet to speak saying, come, come. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. No wonder people flocked out there to the desert to go see what he had to say. It had been 435 years since they heard anyone say, Thus saith the Lord. Man, i got to go listen to that. What must that have been like? Wow. Merry Christmas. How exciting. It makes the little things on your Advent wreath and the little stories look so much better, doesn't it? Whoa, they were anticipating, they were longing, they were saying, come Messiah, come Emmanuel, do something, we want to hear from you, and then <laughs> Jesus blew up on the scene. That was a pregnant pause. <laughs> Translator lady's like, what? <laughs> that wasn't in my notes. <laughs> and then how joyous it must have been to hear the good news to hear of salvation, to hear of God keeping his promises made all the way back in Genesis 3.15, to know that he was working. Say, wow, God 
is doing something. We should go tell people. We should go proclaim it too. We should go up on that mountain and tell it from the mountain and make a Christmas song about it. God is not silent. Think about the magnitude of all this working and what it meant. He's speaking. He was speaking then, and guess what? He's speaking right now. He's speaking to you. He's doing something in your life. He's paved the way for you to encounter his good news and to see who you are and to see who he is and to see how he keeps his promises and to see the glory and the magnitude of Jesus Christ. He's made a way for you to hear. And he's worked it out in your life. In fact, if you're sitting in here, he's done something to get you here. If you're watching online, he's done something to draw you here. If you end up going and you talk to your coworkers and they're, they're talking to you, God has been working in their lives and he's working in your life. God is speaking loud and clear. What are you going to do with what he has to say? I'm going to put that back in your court. How are you going to respond? Because God is not silent. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you work even when we sleep. When we run away from you, Lord, you work. When our children run away from you, you work. You've spoken your truth. We have your truth. You've superintended and cared for your message throughout all these centuries. You've opened the doors. You've paved the roads. You've protected the message. You've proclaimed your message so that we can have a relationship with our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dwell with our God forever. You've done all this because you keep your promises. You speak because you keep your promises, and you're a good God who reveals yourself. Lord, I'm begging you. I'm asking, Lord, please, as we anticipate and long for you to work in our lives, to work in our community, and to work in our church, and to work in our families, and do work in our wayward children or our wayward family, or to do a work, Lord, in those who are just so far from you, they just seem to be scoffing at you. Lord, I'm asking that you would keep working and you would speak boldly. And if you, if you see fit to use us for that message, God, then proclaim your word through us. Make us usable for that purpose, that we could join you in that work and enjoy it and celebrate what you're doing. Lord, I thank you that you were a God who loves us, that you were a God who would send his son to die for us and defeat death for us. I thank you that you would empower Jesus Christ to be raised from the dead and lead us. So help us to hear from you. Lord, help us to hear your voice and to follow you and be your disciples. Lord, be our shepherd and speak clearly to us. And for those who are having a hard time, uncork our ears. Take the blinders off our eyes that we would see you clearly and respond with passionate, fervent worship. But Lord, in the meantime, should you tarry, help us to anticipate you with great longing, and help us to read and reread, help us to encourage others, and help us to put our trust in your promises. I just thank you, God. I thank you that you would do all this and infinitely more. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.